Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, good morning, depending on your time zone. Thank you for joining the Fire Suppression Systems Association webinar on NFPA 855, the standard for the installation of stationary energy storage systems. Your phone lines are muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Attendees can also use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves, but our presenter will not be following along. So if you do have a question, make sure to use that Q&A box. This webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation is over. With us today, we have our webinar moderator, John Mackey, who I will hand it off momentarily to introduce our presenter, Brian. Thanks, John. Thank you, Becca, really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending where you're at. Um, I have the privilege of in, uh, introducing our presenter, Deputy Fire Marshal Brian Scholl, who has seen the impact of ESS fires and incidents, as well as a member of the NFPA 855 committee. Brian will share his perspective on how the code was developed, highlight lessons learned from serious ESS incidents, and how the code should be interpreted and applied. Brian is a deputy fire marshal with the city of Phoenix Fire Department. Throughout his 22 year career, he has worked in many roles, including being a public information officer and managing the special hazards unit. This highly trained inspection unit inspects and permits any facility that stores, handles, and uses hazardous materials, including lithium ion batteries. Brian also serves on many different code technical committees to include NFPA 855 and NFPA 420, the standard of fire protection of cannabis growing and processing facilities. And with that, Brian, I'm gonna turn the audience over to you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, like you said, good morning. It's definitely morning um, where I'm from in, in Arizona here. And then good afternoon. Um, every time that someone says NFPA 420, I chuckle because I, I think at least NFPA has a little bit of humor, but that is a, uh, that's a brand new standard that we're doing. And that might be another uh, webinar that we'll talk about here in the future. Um, so like uh, John said, my name is Brian Scholl, I'm a deputy fire marshal here in the city of Phoenix Fire Department. Um, I'm from Long Island, New York, and then moved to Chicago and then to Arizona, which means I can talk really, really fast and in a hurry. So um, I did just recently have the privilege of going to Quincy, Massachusetts last week for an 855 meeting where we actually talk about what we're going to do for the next edition of 855. So we can talk about that at the end as well. So um, like Becca said, if you have questions, put them in the chat. John's going to be monitoring that. Um, the more questions, the better for the presentation. A uh, couple disclosures. Um, we're not endorsing anything. Uh, we have not received compensation. Um, this is a not a formal interpretation of any codes or standards. Um, the opinion is my opinion alone and doesn't represent um, the FSSA, NFPA, um, nor the Phoenix Fire Department. So, And lastly, um, any pictures um, I pulled from the internet, all the credit goes to the person who took that picture or owns the applicable copyrights. Participation. Um, when John and I um, talked at a previous conference about um, this webinar, we intentionally designed it so there'd be plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, so put your questions in the chat. Um, there's gonna be hopefully a, a lot of time at the end to go through the questions because if you have a question, I guarantee you somebody else on this webinar will have that exact same question. And it gives me more flexibility to start answering questions and start talking about what we see as an AHJ and what we've seen in the industry. So use a chat function. The more participation, the better. So why are we here? That's a good story. Um, Joe McElvaney, who used to be my boss, that I think is on this webinar, um, he talked about, you know, codes are written in blood. Something bad happens and then we change the codes. For us, for the most part in the battery industry, it was McMicken. April 19th, so last week was the anniversary, surprise Arizona, we had a battery energy storage system going to thermal runaway, and we ended up hurting four firefighters. 
this incident brought attention to batteries, especially here in the Phoenix area and across the country. It also gave us a lot of good lessons that we learned, and I'll kind of talk about them in a little bit, because this, this situation only had a clean aging system. That's it, okay? And when this situation happened, and we heard four firefighters, my chief at the time was Chief Mike Molitor. He called me in the middle of the night and said, hey, we heard four firefighters. What does our current code say about batteries? And I said, I don't know, Chief, I'll, I'll look into it. He goes, well, you better, because we have a meeting at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, and I need you to tell me what we're going to do. So we had a meeting the following morning. Sadly, I told the chief that our code pretty much said nothing about lithium ion batteries. And then we end up rewriting the chapter, chapter 12 um, for the Phoenix and the Valley area. So that was my real first introduction to battery energy storage systems. And once again, it's because we heard four firefighters. But then do we actually learn from our lessons? Probably not, because what happened three years almost to the day. Chandler, Arizona. Luckily with Chandler, Arizona, we had no injuries. It burned for two weeks. Make sure everyone understands that it burned for two weeks. We ended up actually using robots because in the McMicken and the reason that Hunter Claire, who was a captain of the crew that was injured, all they were trying to do was open the door to get a, a temperature reading using their cameras. That's all they were trying to do. And they opened up that door and it exploded on them and sent him through a fence. So in the Chandler incident, Hunter was right next to me when we we're talking about what we should do. And one person talked about opening the doors. And Hunter looked at me and said, really? Three years to the day, we're going to do the exact same thing that we did three years ago, and I got hurt. Luckily, um, smarter people prevailed, and we ended up using robots. It was actually very cool. We used one robot to open the door, the other one to push it open and keep it open. And very, therefore, we made sure we had no um, explosion. We did shut down our entire freeway system. So if anyone's been in the Phoenix area, we shut down the I-10 and the 202 for a few hours, and we evacuated neighborhoods while we opened the doors. The trailer was, was a little bit better than McMicken because we did have sprinklers. So there are some debate on if the sprinklers were effective. We know that we had no explosion. So in my opinion, it was pretty effective. The problem we had was runoff. We had millions of gallons of water over those two weeks that we had to do something with because we tested the water. It came back with hazardous materials like benzene. So it had to be brought to a certain facility. So we had millions of gallons of runoff. There actually were using heavy equipment to um, create drainage ponds on site to try to capture all that water. So runoff was a huge issue for us for Chandler. And then we have micro mobility devices. People ask me why I bring this slide in. The public doesn't care if it's a micro mobility device or it's a, a large scale utility based battery system. They just know it's lithium ion batteries. So all the bad publicity we're getting from the micromobility devices, especially in New York, um, the high rise fires that they're having there are crazy because of micromobility devices. And people are lumping them all together. And that's something that we have to work on as an AHJ when I'm talking to the public, as well as the industry going to the public saying these are different. Because the batteries that we're now putting in um, non-occupiable cabinets are a whole lot safer than these micromobility devices. But currently you guys are getting all lumped in together with all these different devices. But what happens when we have a lithium ion battery fire? In McMicken, we had injury. In New York City, from the micromobility devices, we've had a lot of people die. Think about the financial impact. You have people that are now homeless because their high rise has burned. You have facilities that aren't able to go back in operation so the employees don't have a job. The people that supply that facility don't have that job anymore. Me being the public, being the government, we don't have tax coming from that. And we get a very negative public opinion. And that's what we're really working on right now. When I go to different um, city meetings and town hall meetings, it's a very negative public opinion. It has to do with us lumping everything together. And what happens when there's a negative public opinion? We overregulate. 
And overregulating is probably the worst thing. Um, you never want to underregulate, but you never want to overregulate because we don't want to keep stuff from happening. Because I've got a, a slide in here where I talk about we, we want the same thing at the end. We want these projects to be successful. We want them to be safe, but we also want them to be installed because everybody's moving to green energy. And that's what these batteries are doing for us. The way that the NFPA is set up, and I'll kind of talk about that here in a little bit, is it does a really good job, as does the ICC, in bringing in not only just me, the enforcers or the authority have jurisdiction, they also bring in the industry, the manufacturers, the installers, the users, all together so we actually make good codes. And that's kind of important. Because what are some of the positives? We're doing way more testing. Way more testing on these batteries and also more testing on how to extinguish them. Because um, currently, we don't have a good way to extinguish a lithium ion battery fire. It's a chemical reaction, a thermal runaway, that until it's done, we're not doing anything to stop it. We have much better codes than we had when, when they make it happen. Like I said, when you looked at our chapter 12 from the International Fire Code, there was not much in there about batteries. So we rewrote it, and then the latest edition of the ICC, the 2021, has a lot of good information and a lot of good requirements for lithium ion batteries. That's in cooperation with NFP 855. We have much better awareness. And this comes from us as first responders. We are training all the time on lithium ion battery fires, electric vehicle fires, lithium ion vehicles in garages, um, lithium ion batteries in houses, in garages. We have way more awareness and we're way better prepared but we're still not there yet. We're getting there, but we're not toward the end yet. So, like Joe McElveney has said, codes are written in blood. That means somebody got hurt, somebody died. So we always try to learn lessons. What worked well, what didn't work well. McMickens showed us that a clean agent type fire protection system alone is not adequate. We need something else. We need sprinklers if we're going to be in an occupiable space. But once again, we know that sprinklers don't control the thermal runaway. So all we're really doing is cooling it. Now, sprinkler water, as well as the water mist system, is really good about keeping vapors down, which is another thing that um, we're working on here in the valley with one of our battery installations. But sprinklers alone are not going to control the thermal runaway. It's going to do its thing until it's done. McMicken showed us that we need mechanical ventilation. If we had mechanical ventilation, we would not have an explosive atmosphere that we had in McMicken, and we wouldn't have hurt Hunter and his crew. We need detection. Um, right before this, I actually was teaching my inspectors about, about batteries and, and the fire code, and we watched a video of an electric vehicle in, I think it was in China, in a parking garage. And the beginning of the fire is a little wisp of white smoke. Very tough to see it. I actually have to point out, but that's early detection that we're kind of looking at right now is how can we get early detection to know that we might be having a problem with, the thermal, with these um, batteries and thermal runaway. So we know we need detection. We need smoke detection and maybe need gas detection. We definitely need explosion control. This is probably the... Um, toughest one that we're debating in NFP 855 right now is explosion control. What is explosion control? What is NFP 68? What does NFP 69 say? Do we really have good explosion control for these unoccupied batteries cabinets? That's what we're trying to do right now. We know we need training, but it's not just training within the fire department, it's training from the industry training like we're doing right now, and training actually our public. Um, we recently had a um, electric vehicle fire in the city of Scottsdale. If anyone's been into the Phoenix area, Scottsdale is a pretty rich area. And a sad story, um, nobody died, but a young lady um, went to the motor vehicle division to get her learner's permit, she's 15. She gets her permit, her dad says, congratulations, you can drive the Tesla. She puts her foot on the accelerator and 
hits the building right next door to the um, MVD and the, the vehicle catches fire. Scottsdale Fire puts out the fire. We throw it on a flatbed. The driver takes a left-hand turn on the Scottsdale Road and he goes back on a runaway and he drops it in the middle of the street. When I arrived at, as part of the hazmat team, the first thing I said was we should just, just let it burn and we'll be done with this. And the chief at the time said, we cannot let this thing burn in the area that we're at. And that's something that we need to work on is better public information, better training, but also understand that every single installation is different from the next. And that's something that I've been preaching to the industry for a long time is just because you're putting one in here and it's the exact same technology, the exact same number of batteries, every installation is different. And we'll kind of get into that here in a little bit. And one of the biggest things that I'm doing right now is talking about creating partnerships. And it's not just the battery industry. It's every industry out there is creating partnerships with your AHJ, creating partnerships amongst yourselves to have a better idea of what's going on and being 100% transparent. Um, the earlier that you guys come to us to say that, hey, we're thinking of putting this battery in or we're going to might do this battery technology the better it is for everybody because we create those partnerships, we start to know each other and we start to create a trust and really good working relationships early in the process. Because the worst thing is the first time that I meet somebody is when they're submitting plans for a battery system. That is way too far in the game. And then everybody gets mad because now I am slowing up the process because I don't know anything about this battery system. And it takes a lot, a lot of time and a lot of effort to go through the HMAs and the different technical data that's part of the installation. So we need to create these partnerships. Um, somebody, for some reason, I was at a conference talking about batteries. And after the conference, after I spoke, they came up to me and they're like, wow, they really brought an HJ to the conference. I didn't think they'd do that. Like we're some bad person that shouldn't be there or you know, we're the bad guys. We're not the bad guys. We shouldn't be the bad guys. Those days should be long gone. We're partners. We all have a boss and these installations need to be installed. We just need to do it together and make them safe. So that's the number one goal. So how do we try to make these as safe as possible? It starts for us with the codes and standards. You have the International Code Council, which is the ICC, that creates the International Fire Code, the International Building Code. We have the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA. Obviously, I'm on A55 as well as uh, 420, like we joked about. We also have to have standards testing. UL has UL 9540, which is the listing for battery energy storage systems. You look at all the codes, the codes will require NFPA, or excuse me, UL 9540 listing for all batteries. And the test is the 9540A test. So these have all been updated and worked on after McMicken, after um, Victoria um, in Australia, after Moss Landing, after all the fires, we're doing a much better job about getting everyone together in a room and creating better codes. And that's the key to make these things safer. Better codes, but working as a group. Because nobody wants me alone to make up code. Um, at that Scottsdale um, electrical vehicle fire, we had talks amongst the Valley Fire Marshals that we were going to require every tow yard in the Valley to have a spot set aside, 50 foot clear space, so that if we had an electrical vehicle car on fire, that we could put it there and safely put it on their lots. I ran into the owner of a tow company that was helping us get rid of the vehicle. And I talked to him about that. And I said, hey, you know, this is what we're thinking. He goes, if you require me to provide a 50 foot clear space, that's probably 10, maybe 15 cars. He goes, you will put all of us out of business. Because once again, I didn't do what I was supposed to do and I didn't reach out to the industry like I should have. So this is why we need to come together. And that's kind of my last few slides that we'll talk about is we need help um, coming together as partners to make sure the codes are correct. ICC. Um, currently, Chapter 12 is what deals with lithium ion and other batteries. Currently, um, there's a committee called the Fire Code Action Committee. 
that once again, we bring in industry, we bring in manufacturers, AHJs like myself and experts, and we're working on different parts of chapter 12 for um, energy issues. Be careful that just because a jurisdiction adopts chapter 12, we might amend it. In the city of Phoenix, we amend chapter 12 heavily. Ours is probably a little bit more restrictive than most of the country, I would say. Our sprinkler density that we'll talk about here in a little bit is more restrictive. When we require our um, HMAs is more restrictive. So be careful, always look at the code amendments from that local jurisdiction. 855. 855 is gonna regulate the batteries from commissioning to decommissioning. And when we talk about decommissioning, it might be a planned decommissioning or an emergency decommissioning because they had a fire. AP5 is going to talk about fire protection, which is going to be sprinklers, and where you're allowed to put these. For the most part, we're not going to allow you to put them in high rises, and we're not going to allow you to put them in basements. Those are the two things that make it very difficult to put out a fire. A high rise fire and a fire in a basement are the two most difficult places for us to put out fires. So we're not going to allow you to put lithium ion batteries on high rises or in basements for the most part. You know, 9540 and 9548 testing. Um, like I said, the great part about NFPA is they bring in um, all these experts to include UL. So UL is actually on the 9, on, um, H55 committee. And when we have questions about the 9540 testing, they're there to answer the questions because all the codes require these battery systems to be listed in 9540. It's robust fire testing that starts, the standard and the listing starts at the manufacturer. How do they manufacture these batteries? What's the quality control? What happens when one cell goes in a thermal runaway? What happens when the whole rack goes in a thermal runaway? What happens when we lose the entire array? That's what these tests, is, is, that's the data that we get. And if they can pass and get a 9540 listing, then we have some appreciation for the fact that these batteries are probably pretty safe. Now, obviously, it still could go in a thermal way. Things can happen. But for the most part, we can say that it's listed and it's got all the safety features that we're looking for. The goal is we need to create batteries that don't propagate. And for those of you that don't know what propagation is, is if I have one cell have a bad day, that his neighbor next door should not also go into have, having a bad day. So we, want, we don't want one fire from one cell to go thermal runaway and then go to another cell, put that in a thermal runaway, and then we lose the entire array, and then we lose the entire cabinet, or we lose the entire building. We need to create batteries that don't propagate, and that's the number one goal. All the battery manufacturers are doing a bunch of testing. Um, there's a bunch of good testing labs that are doing a lot of good work right now to try to create battery systems that don't propagate from one cell to another cell. Hey, John, do we have any questions? Um, let's have a natural pause here. No questions yet. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go too, too much into the weeds on the code requirements because I was told that you guys have kind of gone through the code requirements pretty well. But the first thing that we need to talk about is this hazard mitigation analysis, the HMA. This is step number one. This is the first thing that you as manufacturers, you as installers, um, you as you know, property managers that are looking for properties, this is the first thing that you need to talk about is do we have an HMA for our batteries? I had someone come up to me recently um, and say, well, sometimes when we pick a site, we don't know the technology, okay? You normally have a couple in mind or two or three. So make an HMA with all three technologies and then we can just get rid of the ones that you don't end up using. But let's start this hazard mitigation analysis early. Because what it does is it looks at the consequences of failure. And, and if you look at the Phoenix Fire Code, we require this for every single battery installation. 855 and the base International Fire Code has three different um, criteria. But we're looking at, we want these all the time. because We want to know what happens when something goes wrong. What happens if your mechanical ventilation uh, fails? We have explosion control. Okay. That makes sense to me. 
what happens if my fire protection system um, doesn't work or my smoke detection system doesn't work? What happens? What are the consequences? And that's what this analysis does for us. It goes through all the different consequences of failure and says, this is what's going to happen. And this is how we're going to try to avoid it or this is how we're going to deal with it. And that's the number one thing that we're looking for. Hazard mitigation analysis take a long time to create and they actually take a long time for us to actually review. So make sure you guys do these early and get these to us as quickly as possible. So do you give us time to go through these? Hey, Brian, I've got a great question to uh -huh. kind of tie right into that. Um, just came in on the Q&A. So who is ultimately responsible for developing and driving the HMA process? The BES manufacturer, the engineer, the owner, the contractor? That's a really good question. So who is ultimately responsible to uh, for the HMA? It, it's going to be the, the installer. It's going to be the person that's coming to me. It's going to be, you know, whatever um, installer saying, hey, we want to do this project, but they're going to be hiring, you know, an engineering firm and the engineering firm is going to be the one that creates this. But at the end of the day, just like the plans, it's going to be part of the submittal package. So it's going to be on that installer or that developer, whoever is the one that's coming to me, we're going to be asking them for the HMA and it's going to be on them to hire an engineering firm or whoever it might be to create that. But at the end of the day, it's the person that's coming to me saying, hey, we want to do this. And we're being the ones that are going to be the ones submitting the plans. So that's a good question. Great. Thank you. Code actually does a really good job talking about, you know, hazard mitigation approval. You know, how can I approve these HMAs? And there's a few of them on the screen. I'm not going to read through them all. But, you know, there's different ways that we basically can say, hey, we're going to approve this HMA. And number three is kind of the, the big one for me because of the McMicken incident is we have deflagration hazards is going to be addressed by an explosion control or other system. That's huge for us. We know that these batteries create enough flammable gases to create an explosive atmosphere. So we want to make sure that the deflagration hazards are addressed in the HMA and I can approve it. Okay. Um, another thing that I'm hoping it's going to be in your HMA. We actually had a lively discussion at 855 last week. It was a plume study or a plume analysis. Those of you that don't know what a plume analysis is, you're basically looking at, we know the gases that come off a battery fire. We've collected that data. So now we know the battery. We know the technology. We know the battery you're putting in. Where is the smoke and toxic and potentially flammable gases going? And I had a lot of people kind of ask me, well, you know, sometimes the studies are not effective. Um, what happens when the wind changes? The more information you can give me, the more information I can bring to my city council, the more information I can bring to my fire chief, the more information I can bring to my mayor saying, most likely on a, on a common day out here in Arizona, this is the wind direction and this is where the plume is going to go. And it helps me get this job pushed through. Because a lot of people will think that they'll ask the question, well, if there's a fire, where's the smoke gonna go? If I don't have any kind of plume study, then I, I don't have an answer. And now they start thinking that maybe we're hiding something. What are you hiding? If you look at all the, all the train derailments that have been happening over, around the country, there's always that, what are they not telling me going on there? So the more information, and the more that we're on the same page when we go to these meetings, the better. So a plume analysis should be part of your HMA. And we're actually looking to put that in actually HMA 5 here in the next edition. So look at that. That's why the plume study is so important for us. It shows us, for the most part, where that plume's going and what's in the plume. And if we can show that it just stays on your property and then it dissipates, perfect. That's a really good meeting I'm going to have with our city council and our public because they're the ones that are going to want to know. Like I talked about earlier, we're not going to we're not going to put these things below grade. Um, that's the one of the toughest fires for us to deal with. Um, we can't get the smoke out of there. Um, it's just it's very deadly for us. So we're not going to allow you to put batteries below grade. We're not going to put allow you to put batteries in electrical rooms. Why would we allow you to put batteries right next to the source of ignition? We're going to be in a separate room. And we're not going to allow them on roofs unless approved by the HJ. 
Um, out here in Phoenix, we are not a big fan of putting these on roofs. Um, so you'd have to have a very compelling argument for us to allow it out here. But it all depends on the HJ. So um, that's why you need to, to contact them early and start these discussions. Do you allow on roofs? If it's a hard no, well, then you know that you have to change your design. And that's why it's so important to actually call us early and start having meetings. We're going to require smoke and fire detection. That's key. We want to know if these things are going into thermal runaway. Um, some jurisdictions have gone to um, early detection, like Austin Fire Department. They do like an early fire detection, um, looking at the first wisp of smoke that come off lithium ion batteries, the, the chemistry that's in that first wisp. Um, for the most part, here in Phoenix, we're looking at smoke detection. We want enunciator panels. Um, and what we want those enunciator panels to do is give us all the information that Hunter was trying to get. Hunter was just trying to open that door to get a temperature reading of what is the temperature inside this room. Man, wouldn't it have been nice for him if we had an enunciator panel tied into the battery management system that gave us all the information, gave us the temperature, gave us the conditions of the batteries, told us which batteries are having an issue so we can actually look at a diagram and say, okay, we know it's the battery in the northwest corner. That's now that's why we're requiring this. We learned from McMicken that if we would have had this enunciator panel, we would not have had four injuries. We're going to require some sort of fire protecting system. If it's an occupiable space, oh, for sure, we're going to require a fire protection system inside. If it's a non occupiable cabinet, now we can start having conversations. I am not a big fan of putting in a fire suppression system, um, wet fire suppression system inside a cabinet. Now, I might require a wet spray system above the cabinets to help with vapor especially if I'm in a very populated area. But as far as putting fire protection in a non-occupiable cabinet, that's kind of going away, but you still might be required to do some sort of fire protection system. You might put a dry chem system in there in case there's a fire in the fan or there's a fire somewhere else to keep it from getting into the batteries. But we're going to require fire protection systems. Hey, Brian, before you get to the uh, fire sprinkler page, I do have some questions I want to bounce okay. off you coming off the Q&A. Uh, one, uh, from Ken Crooks. Are there any requirements for smoke detection and gas detection indicating that they need minimum ratings such as intrinsically safe or explosion proof? So um, explosion proof, um, obviously if you look at class one, div one, class one, div two, that's when you're saying that you know there should be flammable vapors in the air. Um, from what I've seen, there's not too much class one, div one. Um, because the definitions are, you know, there's going to be flammable vapors. Um, so I have not seen too much class one div one. But as far as smoke and gas detection, we're always going to require smoke detection. And the gas detection is going to be based on the fact if you're tying your mechanical ventilation into the gas detection, then you're going to have gas detection. If you're going to let it run 24 seven, then you're probably not going to have gas detection. But as far as class one div one, um, once again, I am not an electrical um, inspector. But I have not seen too much class one div one or class one div two because of the fact that we don't expect flammable vapors to be present um, during the normal operation. Very good. Uh, another question from Kevin Foley. Has low pressure CO2 systems uh, been looked at as far as fire suppression for battery storage? <laughs> All right. So you, if you can pick a some sort of extinguishing agent, we are currently testing it. Um, CO2 is being used, um, a lot of different water type systems, piercing nozzles, um, everything currently is being tested. We're trying to find something. We need that, that pixie dust that's gonna finally put out these lithium ion battery fires. Um, I've seen some good stuff with CO2, but once again, you know, the problem with CO2 is, is are you getting the CO2 into the battery? And then just like a clean agent or a dry chem type system, once you run out of the canister, um, then you're out of your extinguishing agent. And that's why in, you know, here in Phoenix, we are, we're, we're heavy on sprinklers for occupiable buildings, but everything and anything is being tested right now. Um, every single lab that I know um, some working in, they're coming up with some sort of way, is, is, it, is it a fire blanket to put over a car? There's a lot of different things out there, um, but that we haven't found that one thing that yes, this is it. This is what's going to put a thermal runaway or 
or stop a thermal runaway. So everything is being looked at right now. Good question. Great. And then I'll ask one more before we get, uh, maybe help you transition to sprinkler. Uh, what is the concern with fire protection inside the cabinet? So that's a good question. So um, there's an incident in Moss Landing, which is in the Washington state areas, is my understanding. And the theory amongst a bunch of the experts is that the water itself is what caused the other batteries to go and thermal run away. And there's the same theory that's going on with the Chandler incident that the sprinkler water, yes, it, it stopped the explosion, but it added to the fact that it shorted out the other um, batteries and caused them to go into thermal runaway. And that's the issue that we're kind of running into is, are we adding to the problem by putting them in a cabinet? Because if the cabinet's on fire, we are now getting to the, to the point where we're gonna let it burn and we're gonna protect exposures. We may control the vapors. And just putting water inside the cabinets are just not a good idea since they're not occupiable. Um, if you look at the, the hurricane that we just had in Florida, where we had a bunch of electric vehicles um, get submerged by seawater, and as soon as the water receded, the electric vehicles went in a thermal runaway. So we're looking at it, once again, a bunch of different labs are also testing this is, what is, what is the water doing? Is it helping us as much as we think it is, or is it really actually hurting us and going in a thermal runaway? So that's why I was, trust me, three years ago, I was water, 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 fill it up, um, close the doors, let you know, turn into a pool. But the more research that I'm looking at, the more I'm seeing that if it's a non-occupiable cabinet that's outside, that I don't, maybe I don't want to put sprinklers in there. I might have a dry cam, static, something like that, no offense to statics folks, something like that, but having a wet suppression system inside the cabinets, I don't think that's the, the answer anymore. Great, thank you. So that was a good transition. So fire sprinklers, if it's in a building, if it's in a connex box, if it's in anything where I can put somebody inside it, we're gonna have wet sprinklers. Um, that's just the way it is. I'm worried about explosion. I'm worried about the people that are working in and around there. If I can occupy it, I'm going to have sprinklers. In Phoenix, we're 0. 0.6. That's a big sprinkler system. But when we were doing our code, a very smart um, individual on our fire safety advisory board um, brought the question and asked the question to me and said, do I think that batteries are more or less dangerous than tire storage? And I thought it was a trick question. So I said, I think they're way more dangerous. He goes, well, then why is it a 0. 0.6 GPM required for tire storage? And we're requiring something less for batteries. And that's where the 0. 0.6 comes from. So I always like to try to, when we do fire code, we try to educate and say, this is where things come from. That's where we came with our 0. 0.6. Code allows large scale fire testing. If they wanna use some sort of alternate automatic fire control and suppression system, um, like we just talked about with that question, there's a lot of good ideas out there. We just haven't found the one that actually does the job we need to do. Uh, Brian, another question along the same lines. Sure. Uh, this is from Luke McDermott. Uh, in an occupied area, would you recommend clean agent along with auto sprinkler system based on FM sheet 5-33? Yes. Um, I am a big proponent of putting in both. Um, hopefully that dry chem, that clean agent does the job. Um, let's say it was a fire in the fan. That, that clean agent system um, puts out the fire. The sprinklers never activate. Life is good. But in the event that, just like we saw in McMicken, is we didn't open up those doors till an hour and a half later, almost two hours later. Well, by that time, that entire dry chem system was depleted and, and probably leaking. I don't know if they ever did a door fan test but it was probably leaking out. So we didn't have any um, fire extinguishing agent left. So that's why we need the redundant system where we have a clean agent plus the uh, sprinkler system. Yes, 100%. Great. And another question from Sean Avis. What is the design area associated with the 0. 0.6 GPM square foot? Uh, 2,500 or, there we go. Yeah, it's over 2,500. I'm sorry, I thought it was in the slide. Good question. Uh, most of the time, um, the Connex boxes are smaller than that. So, you know, you're going to do it for the design area. 
All right. And another another question too. I'm not sure where this is uh, timed right, but how does Phoenix differentiate between stationary ESS and lithium ion vehicle parking storage? <laughs> Ooh, um, that is a wonderful question. And um, so the, the problem currently is the codes do, don't do a very good job on the, either the storage batteries that aren't actually part of a system and electric vehicles themselves. Um, one of the big things that I'm working on right now is electrical vehicles and parking garages. I'm the task group chair for that group for the FCAC, which is the Power Code Action Committee for the ICC, to look at that. Um, the next editions, we're, we're hopefully going to do a lot better job with um, battery storage and, and electrical vehicle parking um, because it's such a, a, a concern of ours. Because if I have an electrical vehicle fire in a parking garage that's hooked into a charging system. First of all, how do I shut off the charging system? So I got to put that in the code. And then how do we, do we, do we fight the fire in there? Do we pull the car out? We're looking at a bunch of different things there. And then what happens to that structure in that parking garage with all that heat from that lithium ion battery fire? Are we compromising that entire parking garage? And um, yes, that's a big deal right now. And we are definitely looking into what to do and which direction to go. So um, at the end of my presentation, I'll talk about you know participating in the code um, processes. That's why we need more from the industry to come help us you know write the codes so that they're effective. Very good question. And one other one going back to density. Uh, this is from Joe Saffer. Uh, what is the design area required for the 0.6 density and required hose allowance? So I'd have to do. Um, I'd have to go look back in the code. That's a, that's a way more technical question than I was prepared for today. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, if you get me his information, I can uh, reach out or I can go through, uh, if you want to go through you guys and then I can go back through you guys to get the answer out. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. All it's right. Make me think at 9 a.m. <laughs> All right, um, some more of the COVID requirements. I'm see mechanical ventilation because we want to make sure that that um, atmosphere does not become flammable. If for some reason um, our mechanical ventilation doesn't work, we're going to move to explosion control by deflagration panels, that type of situation. We have to have an adequate water supply. Um, even though we may not try to put out the fire of the battery itself, we want to expect um, protect exposures. We want to keep the vapor down. So we need an adequate water supply. And that may be you know, more of a water tank, you know, per NFA uh, 1142. You know, I'm not saying, you know, if we're in the middle of nowhere where there is no water supply that we're going to make you put a full hydrogen system in. We may may allow you to do, you know, 30,000, 40,000 gallon water tank where we can actually shuttle water tankers back and forth. But we need some sort of water out there. But this is the fun part because we all can read the code and I can get 10 people to read the same code section and we all get a different interpretation. So this is the kind of things that I need you guys to start thinking about because this is what we're looking at. The first question is, is this battery energy storage system inside a building or a cabinet? If it's inside of a building, we have the loss history to be very nervous about that. If you put them in non-occupiable cabinets outside, it's not as concerning for me because now I don't have to worry about putting my folks in harm's way to try to get inside if there's someone that fell down, someone that got hurt, whatever it might be. I don't have to put my people in harm's way. We go from a safe distance, spray water where we want to spray water, and let, let it burn. So that's the first question. Um, I believe the industry, especially on the utility side, is doing a really good job about going towards outdoor non-occupiable cabinets, but obviously we still have some. Um, I know data centers and those type of facilities um, are still you know, looking at the indoor conic stocks type. Um, but obviously, from my point of view, if you're going to put it inside a building where I can go inside either conic stocks or an actual building, the code requirement is going to be much more stringent. You guys should be looking at the results of the HMA. You guys should be having conversations with your engineering firm, whoever you hire to do the HMA, and have a discussion and be prepared to present it to me. Because the questions that you guys come up with are the same questions that I have. How are we going to deal with these consequences of failure? 
what what is your system going to do? A big one these days is where are you going to put these things? I have two in the city of Phoenix that are in very populated areas. My requirements are going to be a lot different than um, a fire chief or fire marshal that I'm working on on the west side of Phoenix uh, in Power Alley, where there's no houses within 15 miles of, of, the, of the batteries. Well, that's totally different. I'm worried because I, if the vapors get out, out if we have a fire, I'm going to have a smoke cloud. It's going to go somewhere. And where is it going to impact? So where's the location? Obviously, you know, we can't help it. If you need to put in populated areas, we do. You just realize it's going to be a lot more stringent than what happened in the middle of nowhere. And I stress that every single installation is different. So just because you put the same technology, the same exact design in one location, it may not work in another location based on the fact that now you're more populated. So keep that in mind when you guys are installing these or looking to install these. Do your research. What is the local history of fires? When McMicken happened, I can almost guarantee you that the fire marshal from Surprise, if you came to him within a few months of McMicken saying, hey, I want to put a battery in your storage system in, he'd probably say, hell no. We just heard four firefighters. Of course it's going to be no. Okay. What is the history? You know, and also as far as what is the history, what are they, what are they done? You know, are they like Phoenix where we changed our entire code so we seem like we know a little bit more about it? Do you think the capabilities of Phoenix is going to be a lot different than the capabilities of a volunteer? No offense to the volunteer fire departments. To, to a volley um, type department, of course. Should that impact your design? It could, definitely could. But understanding what is our capabilities? In Phoenix, we don't have borders. We have automatic aid. So we can bring in a ton of resources if we have a battery energy storage system fire. If I'm a volunteer fire department in the middle of nowhere in the desert in Arizona, do I have the same capabilities? And you guys have to look at that. And what's the code knowledge? Um, I talk to a lot of people around the country about you know, batteries and what the code is just to get everybody on the same page. Because once again, a lot of times if someone doesn't know something or feel comfortable with something, it's gonna be a no. Just because they don't understand the codes, they don't understand the technology, it's gonna be a no. We have to get past that. I am trying to do my best to train up people um, throughout the country to get everybody on the page. There's a bunch of good people out there. Um, Chief Michael O'Brien from Brighton, Michigan, um, he's been going around trying to educate. We're trying to educate to get everybody on the same page, but you may run into a jurisdiction that doesn't have the code knowledge that some other jurisdiction might. That's your opportunity to help them out, educate them, help them. Call us as soon as possible. Um, I beat this horse to death um, for, for months now. If you think that you might be going into a spot, call that um, AHJ, call that fire department, call that building department and say, hey, we're thinking of doing this. I just had a conversation. I'm going to speed up here. I just had a conversation with a company that um, they're two years out and the original um, vision is they're just going to build cabinet. That's it. And then three years from now, they're going to start bringing in batteries. That's perfect. Let's start talking about this. Is your warehouse adequate? What do we need to do? Understand the processes. Does plan of you go to the fire department? Does it go to the county? Does it go to the building official? What's the appeal process? Let's say you've got alternate means and methods. How do you put that in? You know, you have the large scale fire testing. Is it through the appeal process? And create that open dialogue. Code allows us to do third-party technical assistance. Don't be afraid of that. If you come to me with a very technical battery system, I might require third-party technical assistance to help me. It benefits you. Helps me, and it benefits you guys. Best way to, to interpret the code is create partnerships. Start talking. The sooner we talk, the better. Meetings as soon as possible. Pre-construction meetings, timely meetings, regular scheduled meetings. Just throw a meeting. Hey, let's meet every month, um, you know, and then we can always change it. Get my phone number. Get my email. What are my work hours? Because if I don't, if I don't 
respond to you, then you know, well, yeah, it's four o'clock here, but yet it's, you know, seven o'clock on the East Coast. And make sure you answer your phone calls and emails. That's always important. Start with your timeline and then work backwards. Keeping in mind that plan view can take months. Open communication is the key. We got to communicate with each other. And we want the same thing. Everybody wants project completion. We're not the stumbling block. We shouldn't be the barrier. But you, you still have to go through us in order to get project completion. So we have the open communication. We're hopefully going to get success and completion. Avoid errors. Understand what code edition I am. If you come to me and say that you want to um, work under the 2021 international fire code, that's not me. If you tell me you want to do the base 2018 fire code, that's not me. Or the Phoenix fire code, we amend it. What edition am I on? What edition of A55 do I adopt? And this is more of Joe McElvaney because he used to tell me this all the time. Hey, everybody makes mistakes. We own it, we move on. If I say no for a reason, and then you give me a compelling argument to change my no from a yes, yeah. Hey, my mistake, let's move on. Hey, Brian, before we get into code consistency, um, I'm going to take some time to kind of knock off some of these questions that we got in the Q&A. Okay. All right. So from Nicholas Harris, he says, so for a system equipped with a sprinkler, ensuring designing adequate water supply straightforward and a phase 13, how mm -hmm. about for remote systems with no sprinkler? Do you work with local fire department to make sure they have adequate resources to respond to the site with enough water? Yep. Or, so, or, yeah, yeah. So, so if you have a very remote site that doesn't have the water supply infrastructure like we have here in the city of Phoenix, yeah, that's when you're going to look at, am I just going to bring in, you know, a um, a water tank, install water tank, 30,000 gallons um, with the ability for, for tankers to hook up to it and fill it as we go. Um, that's why you need to talk to, to your local AHJ. What are they looking for? Um, you know, sadly, I, I've run in some AHJs that they don't want anything. They're not going to do anything. I'm not, I don't think that's the answer. But talking to them early can get you on the right path saying, okay, now I understand what you guys want. Good question. Very good. Another question. How are EV charging stations at petroleum fueling stations looked at for minimum distances between EVs and fuel pumps? Another good one that sadly, it, I think it was one of those days where I think I was at the airport and we we're having a meeting and I was kind of listening in and I kept on saying that I would I would share that task group if nobody else wanted to. That's another thing we're looking at is outdoor um, charging because um, currently there's no good requirements as far as emergency shutoffs. Like if I'm a normal gas station, there's a big bozo button that I can push to shut off the, the gas pumps. If I'm doing a liquid petroleum um, propane fueling operation, same thing. There's a button there I can push. We don't have good codes yet um, for electrical vehicle charging, locations, uh, virtual shutoffs, all that kind of stuff. That's stuff that we're looking at. Um, so hopefully that'll be in the next edition. Now, remember for any HJ that's on this uh, webinar, you can actually, um, once we create the code language, it's really easy to, to adopt it and mend your code before it actually becomes in that edition. Um, because you can kind of say, hey, this is going to be in the 2021. Let's just, you know, adopt it now. So that's an option. But that's, a yeah, that's one of the ones. Parking, parking and parking garages. Yeah, yeah it's a huge deal. I don't know if you answer on that one. Very good. Another question. Uh, what is your definition of a safe distance from a battery <laughs> enclosure fire? Um, uh, emergency response guide, I think, is quarter mile. Um, I think when we when we did the Chandler incident, I think we evacuated a mile or two miles. Um, it's really tough. It, it based on the size and the configuration of the batteries and kind of where you're at. Um, the one that I'm doing with the water spray system, um, the original proposal was, was it to be a dry pipe and then we'd have to actually hook up to it and, and pump it. Once again, now I'm putting my firefighters in that area. So there's no good definition of a safe distance. Um, code does talk about remote locations, which is 100 feet from property lines. Um, but there, I don't have a good definition of a safe distance. Um, it's going to be based on, on a lot of different factors. Um, yeah, I don't have a good definition of safe distance. OK. What else you got? Uh, let's go back to code consistency, and uh, we'll come back to questions. 
Okay. So um, how do we, so before I die or before I retire, let's go with that. That's, that's, that's much more positive. Before I retire, um, I would like to see us be very consistent on the code. Um, it is not easy. I try to do this just in the Phoenix area amongst our Valley um, fire marshals. And we struggle to have the same exact code because we all are looking at things differently. Obviously in Phoenix, um, for those of you who don't know, we have the Brett Harbor. We lost a firefighter in a supermarket that, that was added on and added on and added on. Um, we ended up getting lost in there. So we, we had the Brett Harbor sprinkler ordinance that would basically sprinkle everything. Um, so it's difficult, but if I can get code consistency, it makes it easier for the industry because then you know that if you go to Phoenix, it's these are the rules, the same rules that if I go to Stockton, California, or if I go to Long Island, New York, um, that's what I'm, tr I'm trying to do. And 855 is a good starting point. Um, trying to get 855 done correctly and hopefully make it consistent so we can adopt 855. But with consistency, we need training. We need training on the industry so you guys are installing them the same way and understand how to interpret and how to put forth um, a good battery system. We need to train in the fire service to make sure that we all respond to these the same way. If I don't like that the... the we're using the term let it burn. Um, I don't like that term. I want to be more of a, we're going to be a defensive fire, which means we're going to let it burn, but it sounds better on TV. Um, but that should be our goals is if we can, you know, be defensive and let these things burn itself out. We need training it amongst the AHJs so that when you go to middle of nowhere um, to put a battery system in, that, that fire marshal has had access to um, different trainings to get them up to speed. And using organizations like um, the FSSA and other, and other organizations to get these words out like we're doing today, to try to get us all on the same page. Because once you understand where I'm coming from and I can understand where you're coming from, that's where we start actually making real good codes. And that's what I'm looking for. And this is the fun part. This is what I need help with, is I need more help with A55 and also with the ICC, the Fire Code Action Committee. Um, you can go to NFPA's website. Um, I'm not plugging NFPA. I'm just saying that this is the standard that we're basically building to regulate your industry or your product or how you do things. So the more participation we have, the better. You don't want me being the only one in that room making up rules because I can do that. I can make up a rule, but is it correct? Does Is it helpful? Is, does it really mean anything? So the, the better, the more participation we get in all the different codes and standards, the better. So please, please, you got free time. I know no one has free time, but if you have some time, you can just, um, get away from a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different codes and standards that we really need help on. Participate in the ICC, um, same thing. Um, the coach the coach should be um, working together as opposed to be working against each other. And that's kind of why I'm on both sides to make sure that we build codes and standards that actually help each other out. They're consistent. Be open and transparent on lessons learned. This is a big one. Um, everyone signs an NDA. Yeah, you sign an NDA for everything these days. But is that really helping us? If I don't know why we lost a battery, does that help me create better codes? Does that help us create better batteries? Um, it's a tough, a very touchy subject. I totally understand. But do NDAs really do that much for us? Do they really help us? Because I'd really like to know lessons learned as soon as possible. So we can change things that we need to change right now, change technology, change safety, change codes. Um, but try to be as open and transparent as we, as we can to learn from what we've, we've done, learn from our lessons. Hey, Brian, this is, uh, if I could make it just a process check, we're at noon um, central and I know the call is scheduled for an hour, but uh, I know I still have probably 10 questions to go through in the q and I know you probably have five or six more slides. so. Um, we still good with uh, on your schedule, Brian, with regard to time. And I'm good. And it's so funny because you know when you practice, you know, by yourself, like I was <laughs> done in like 35 minutes. So it's just comical, you know, <laughs> as you do by yourself. You're like, oh, plenty of time. So yep. yeah, I'm good. It, it feels like that other conference I was at, and I was like, oh man, it's not too much. Very good. So for the listeners, we're going to keep this thing rolling uh, to allow to answer as many questions as we can, as well as uh, allow Brian to get through all of his content. Yeah, I only got a few more slides kind of going over what's what's next out there. Obviously, um, LFP batteries are a big thing. Um, 
lithium ion phosphate batteries, um, hydrogen fuel cells. Um, that's I'm told is the next next big thing. Um, hopefully new firefighting mediums and tools, um, new fire and life safety systems that are coming online. Um, a lot of stuff. Um, we're changing a lot of the lead acid batteries to lithium ion batteries. Um, I got a facility out here in Phoenix that, that you know did this without permits. Um, and now they're trying to go back and figure out how to make it work. But um, but also we're also seeing a lot more facilities instead of go through lithium ions, they're going to lead acid again. Um, especially if they just needed to to get that gap between when they lose power and then when the generators kick on. Um, a lot of times lead acid can actually, you know, be really beneficial to them and it's not as stringent code wise. Hey Brian, I've got a question specific to lead acid. Um, what should we be doing for data centers when they want to change out the lead acid batteries to lithium ion? <laughs> um, talk to your local ASJ as soon as possible because if they've got a standard sprinkler system, you know, maybe a 0.5, um, you know, depending on what how it was built, and you have to come up in Phoenix to a 0.6, I mean, you're talking about new piping, um, a lot of upgrades to that sprinkler system. Um, so the earlier that we can have discussion, because maybe that's not the best plan, or maybe instead of switching it out inside the building, then we put it outside and, you know, put it in non-occupiable cabinets. Once again, the sooner you can come talk to me or come talk to that local HJ is the better, because like I said, I have one that did this exact same thing and, um, they just didn't know any better. And, and, you know, I wish they would have got better advice from whoever installed it, but yeah, they did this. And then now we're trying to figure out how to make it work because their sprinkler system is very old and does not, cannot meet 0.6 the way it's installed. So we have to basically redo the entire system, which is very, very costly. Very good. Uh, other things that we're seeing, um, I'm seeing a lot of generators go from diesel to, to batteries, to lithium ion batteries, because um, now we get rid of the diesel and a lot of environmental and a lot of federal government regulations. Battery fire pumps. We're starting to see a lot of those start coming online. Parking garages, like I talked about, <laughs> It was a good question that that came up. Um, can they support the weight of the, of the electric vehicles? Um, I know the um, parking garage failure in uh, New York City. Um, that's one of the questions: is did they have you know electric vehicles? Because electric vehicles probably twice the weight of a normal um, car. So did that add to that collapse of that parking structure? I don't know. Spring system design, you know, charging stations. That's a big one for us. And then you know what happens when they're on fire. This is all the stuff that we're currently trying to figure out um, for the next editions. And we don't know what's next. Um, let's start that conversation on all the new technologies. Um, we need to try to be as transparent as possible. I understand, you know, it's proprietary and, and, and that kind of stuff, but open conversations, creating partnerships, that's what this is all about. Um, we should be looking at this as you know, as a as a team, you know, trying to come up with solutions to be able to be successful and get these things installed, and have the fire department, have the city, have the public, have a sense of of comfort, understanding that they we've gone through all of the different um, boxes and checked them all off, and we've done as much as we can to make them as safe as possible, and we can't do that unless we work together. Nice done, Brian. It's only 10 05. That's not, I mean, like, come on. Like, Chicago, like, like fire department time, like anyone on there from the fire department, they know it's always 10 minutes late. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, I want to go through some of the questions I have here. Uh, and from a uh, think from a scheduling perspective, we're down to about five, six minutes left. Yep. So um, I'll try to pick off the, the questions in order. And so I apologize for the randomness at this point. <laughs> um, how can one UL 9540A test ensure the data we are getting is statistically significant? And if the test is done again, you will get the same results. I wish I had um, Howard Hopper on from UL. Um, that is a question not that I could answer. Um, you know, the idea of the large scale um, testing from 9540A is that it's um, you can do the same test over and over and get the same results. But that's not a question that I can answer. That's a, definitely a UL question. Got it. 
Uh, do you, this is an anonymous question, uh, do you require explosion venting or active explosion mitigation systems if the energy storage system has active ventilation? And that's a very good question because that's what we're looking at right now. Because that active ventilation system, when you, when you do the HMA, what happens when that active ventilation system fails? And that's what we need to know. Um, for the most part, for me, you're gonna have both. You're gonna have ventilation and you're gonna have explosion control. So if the ventilation fails, then we have the explosion control to back us up so we don't hurt anybody. So, but that's part of your HMA and that's part of your due diligence for the AHJ is to have those discussions. You know, what are they gonna require? Here in Phoenix, for the most part, we're probably gonna require both. Very good. Uh, another anonymous question, is flooding a battery enclosure equivalent and acceptable to an exclosure to an enclosure sprinkler system like a, a total flooding system um so let's think about total flooding system um yes it's going to do what a sprinkler system will do um are the walls are, is the floor um can it handle that weight um and then what else are we doing inside that room um i'd have to see some technical data if you we were trying to do that in phoenix on how that would look you know, a total flooding system. Um, now, if you're talking total flooding, it's more of a gaseous type system. We've discussed that. But if you're talking flooding with water, um, I'd have a lot of questions on that. Got it. Um, one comment, not a question, but Colorado Springs just passed local amendments on EV charging requirements. We want to reach out to Colorado Springs. Reach out to me. Want, all HJs want to let them know. Yes. Um, do battery charging rooms for lift trucks, for example, or are they in the scope of this standard and how are they classified? So that's interesting. So um, that is something that we're looking at for the next edition. Um, I think when we first started A55, um, our scope was very narrow and the, um, the Coats Council, um, which is the body that, that runs NFPA, um, has done a very good job of allowing us to move into different directions. And that's one of the things that we're looking at is charging of all types of batteries. Um, forklifts, um, smaller ones like that up to the vehicle itself. And also looking, one that um, we were talking about the other day was I've got a, a bus fleet that has solar and batteries. And at the end of the day, I wanna be able to um, discharge my battery back into the grid to make a little bit of money. Um, so we're looking at stuff like that. So all of this stuff we're looking at, um, once again, you know, if it's your expertise, if, you, if that's your, your field, please join us. If nothing else, to be a guest, if you can't get on the committees themselves, you can be a guest and, and give the information. Um, you know, the more the more input we have, the better these folks are going to be. Very good. I'll ask one more question, then we'll we'll wrap up. So, um, how is ESS rental units going to be regulated, i.e., for hospitals, schools, etc.? Uh, I'm assuming we're talking about mobile ESS. Um, yeah. Once again, that's another um, chapter that we're diving more into. There's a, we talk a little bit about it, but once again, you know, the problem with codes is we're three years behind. So when we when we published A55, we we're all excited. We're like, woo, we took care of everything. And then, I mean, it's not even an hour after we publish it that new things are coming in. Um, mobile ESS, um, that's a big one. We have... Um, EV chargers in parking garages that have lithium ion batteries as part of the charging system. There's just so many things that are out there that we're trying to tackle. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's immense. So it, we're definitely looking at that. Um, yeah, it's a lot. Very good. And then lastly, Brian, um, as we wrap up, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing this information with us. This, is, this has been a great, Great discussion and, and you know really informative. So thank you for that. Um, for the people that want to uh, follow up with you with a question, there you go. Perfect timing. <laughs> how do you how do you prefer people to reach out to you? Uh, yeah, email's fine, um, and that's my cell phone number. You know, you know, shoot me a text, give me a call. Uh, but email is probably the best. Um, a lot of people have found me on LinkedIn as well and asked me questions. So um, you know, if it's something that that pertains to this um, webinar itself. Self, you know, I'd like them to kind of try to go through you because once again, if someone has a question, I guarantee you somebody else on this webinar had that same question. So if we're able to give the answer out to everybody, um, that'd be the best. But um, so reach out to me directly or go through the um, FSSA and we'll get them answered. 
Very good. Thank you, Brian. And just from an overall process perspective, uh, to kind of add on to what Brian was saying, and a question came in through the Q&A, uh, this presentation uh, is going to be available on the FSSA website, uh, as well as the FSSA YouTube channel. It has been recorded. Um, and with that, I will turn this over to Becca for last minute you know, uh, process checks. And uh, with that, I think Brian is complete. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today. Um, it was a great presentation. And as John said, you, you took the rest of my part. Um, the, the recording and the presentation will be available on the FSSA website. Um, it'll be underneath the webinars tab. You'll see a link to view all past webinars, and that information will be loaded on there in the next couple of days. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.